Good morning, everybody, and happy uh, International Women's Day. Um, you are all very, very welcome, and thank you so, so much for uh, attending uh, our special event on women and HIV. I am, I'm Sue Carter, and I'm going to be your host um, today. But before I introduce you to our wonderful panel of women, I just want to speak a little bit about uh, International Women's Day and what the aim of this panel discussion is. Um, International Women's Day, the, the 8th of March, is a day of uh, to celebrate the, the social, economic, political and cultural achievements of women around the world. It's also a day to mark a call to action uh, to reinforce our commitment um, to, to reaching uh, uh, gender equality. Every year there's a different theme and this year's theme is Break the Bias. And it's really about us acknowledging and challenging the, the biases, stereotypes and discrimination that exist um, against women are and are preventing us reaching um, a gender equal world. The aim of our um, panel discussion today is to highlight the many and varied issues that women living with HIV, including trans women living with HIV, continue to encounter. Um, we're also going to consider what we can do or what can be done to overcome these issues. And as it's a day of celebration, we do want to celebrate the lives of women living with HIV. Um, our, I, I'm, I'm delighted to have our, our panel uh, with us today who are going to share their expertise, their knowledge um, that they have um, come across you know, these issues in either their work, their, through their research, um, or even through their lived experiences. So I really think it's going to be a wonderful conversation that we're going to have um, today. We would really like you to get involved uh, as the audience. Um, you can do so by making comments or asking questions, and you can use the chat or Q&A function in your taskbar. Um, Susan Donnellan, my colleague, is working there in the background, and she's going to monitor the chat and we, she will also put up any links to websites or organizations that might be referred to uh, during uh, the discussion today. And this will be shared with you again, um, also um, with the, a link to the recording of, of this discussion um, as well, probably tomorrow or the day after. And um, so I'm going to stop sharing now and introduce you to our panel. Um, first of all, I'll, I'll go to Erin since um, I'm, I'm working with you for, for years now. Um, Susan is actually, I'm going to just give a brief introduction. Susan is going to put uh, the panelists full bio in, in, in the chat function there. But Erin uh, Nugent is, um, she manages the community support and HIV and STI testing services in HIV Ireland. Erin um, has volunteered and worked in the HIV field for, for 30 years. Um, she has a, a master's in education from UCD and a PhD in sociology from uh, Trinity College Dublin. So you're very welcome, Erin. Um, next, uh, Mary Jo, I'd like to welcome you. Mary Jo is um, a peer support worker with HIV Ireland's National Peer Support Programme. She also is a member of Positive Now's um, women's group. She also represents people living with HIV on the Fast Track Cities um, steering committee. Um, she lives in Ireland, she's from Ireland, and she won't mind me saying this now, but she is 58, nearly 59 years of age, so looking good, Mary Jo. Um, next is um, uh, Nadine Ferris France, and Nadine has been uh, working in the, the field of HIV, um, uh, global health, and um, gender based violence for, for over 25 years. She is a um, an activist, a writer, a, a trainer and a coach, among other things. Um, she currently works part time as CEO of Beyond Stigma, which is an organization that uh, focuses on uh, self stigma. And she also works part time as an executive director of the Irish Global Health um, Forum network network. Sorry, Nadine. Um, <laughs> and last but not least, um, I'd like um, to um, welcome our final panelist all the way from from Italy. Thank you so much for taking time out of your holiday to be with us today. Uh, this is Ellie Marley and Ellie has just completed her PhD um, in DCU. Her PhD 
uh, focused on the narratives of 12 women living with HIV in Ireland. And so I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, more about that. And um, she currently works as a research officer with um, HICRA. So there are panelists. Um, so I just want to remind people to um, put in any questions or comments that you, they may have um, in, in, into the chat or the Q&A function. If you want to ask a, a specific panelist a question, just pop their name in first and I'll be able to um, direct that to them. Um, uh, so I think we'll kick off, shall we? Okay, and Erin, I'm going to go um, to you again first. Um, and I suppose I was looking at the data um, that has been that from the HPSC that shows that over the last number of years, between 21, I think, and 25% of all new diagnoses of HIV in Ireland are among women. From your experiences of, of managing community support, do many women seek support? And when they do, what are the kind of issues that they're, they're looking for support on? Okay, so yeah, we do get women uh, seeking support. Uh, a lot of the times it's people uh, wanting to come in for counseling. A lot of the times it's around advocacy, for example, um, discrimination related issues. So they would have felt that they would have experienced discrimination, particularly in relation to uh, the refusal of goods or services as a result of um, them living with HIV. So we provide uh, support there. Um, Specifically, though, I, I suppose, right, if you take out the, the kind of psychosocial issues, which I know are going to be discussed later, um, two, two areas, I suppose, that uh, women come to us uh, over the years about very specifically related to women are, are breastfeeding and IVF treatment. Those are the two, I think, very sort of female related um, issues. We know that Ireland has a very um, low level um, of, of breastfeeding compared to other world countries. And we know that uh, breastfeeding is more likely to occur in uh, resource poor countries. So for us, we see this issue mostly with migrants coming in who are really struggling with this idea that uh, breastfeeding is, is problematic for them because the U equals U message doesn't translate to, to breastfeeding. We know that um, breast milk can, can have very high levels of immune cells um, that can't be picked up when there is viral load testing. And we know that babies consume a lot of milk and therefore that is seen as a, a problem and mothers are encouraged to breastfeed. Um, I'm, sorry to, so I'm sorry, to bottle feed. Um, we know that moms feel very strongly, um, not all moms, but some moms feel very, very strongly about continuing to, to breastfeed um, despite this message. And they educate themselves uh, very much on the, the risks and they feel that they want to um, make decisions about this um, for them and for their child in particular. And we also, know that some of the women coming into us are worried about being seen not to breastfeed because of cultural issues. There is a great document that was done in 2015, which was a collaboration between HIV consultants and um, people working in the uh, maternity field. And basically it's a document which pretty much says that you can support women to breastfeed if certain criteria are, are met. And it's a really, really good document and it would make sense to anybody who was reading it that you know, this is something that you know, could be enacted if women got support. That is really good for, for people in the actual HIV field to know, but where we see problems occurring is where women are meeting people outside the HIV arena who are having a lot of difficulties with uh, women who want to breastfeed and who are being pressured into uh, bottle feeding. In some cases, we've actually seen women threatened with social services because they want to, to breastfeed. So this is, um, again, something that is, is sort of ongoing. It's not really talked about that much, but it is definitely a concern for uh, the many women who really do want to, to breastfeed, to get support in breastfeeding, but who are just being met with um, some conflict, as I said, outside the, the HIV arena in particular. 
in, in especially the healthcare arena outside of HIV. Um, in I suppose in terms of the women who don't want to be seen not to breastfeeding um, or just, sorry, not to breastfeed, we see this particularly in women coming from countries where HIV is endemic, where not breastfeeding is a signifier that somebody is living with HIV. And so that is often a very great struggle, particularly uh, indirect provision centers where, you know, they're more likely maybe to be, you know, sharing small spaces with strangers. And so as, as you know, people, um, sorry, women want to breastfeed, right? They're, they're kind of looking at ways where they can hide it. They're struggling with the, the guilt. They're worried about the stigma of not breastfeeding. And that can be really um, a, lot of, a lot of weight on them. One of our outreach workers, I remember years ago, came across a mother who was putting honey on her nipples just so that the child would, you know, latch, even though she wasn't producing any milk. It was just having the child at her breast and being seen to breastfeed the baby that was very important to her. So that's, that's I guess, uh, uh, an issue, uh, obviously, for women breastfeeding. Another issue is IVF. Um, a lot of people may not know this, but any woman living with HIV who wants to undergo certain procedures in IVF, I mean, IVF is actually a very big area, and there's certain procedures done at particular times and in particular ways, but for many women living with HIV, whether they are uh, single or whether they're in a relationship, they have to go to the UK for this because there is not a designated lab for women living with HIV. Um, and that's what's required. Um, and I think it's actually a European directive. Um, and so when you look again at the U equals U message, which seems really, really great, and it doesn't apply to breastfeeding, it certainly doesn't apply to IVF. So women um, often have to head to the UK in particular, which obviously brings up issues of having to go to another country for alternative health care and the, um, I suppose, isolation and, and shame that, that that can bring. So uh, breastfeeding and IVF are issues that women uh, come to us about. Okay, Erin, just that you mentioned U equals U twice there. Um, oh. Could you do, give a really brief, um, so just in case people have never heard of U, yeah. equals U what does that actually mean? Yeah, very good point. And I'm sorry, I'm so no, okay. throwing out that term. <laughs> I'm assuming everybody knows. So basically, if somebody living with HIV is on medications, the medications reduce the amount of virus in the blood to what's called an undetectable level. So when the virus is undetectable, the person cannot transmit HIV. So it's very, very good news in relation to uh, sexual transmission. So, you know, somebody, as I said, who's on medication, whose viral load is undetectable, which it usually does become between three and six months after starting medication, they cannot transmit HIV. So that's a really good point, Sue, is again, is that that really brings up for many women this idea of, oh, it's okay here, but it's not okay for these really important aspects of my life. Yeah. Um, that message, yeah. Thanks so much, Erin. Ellie, I might bring you in um, next, and Erin kind of alluded to the psychosocial impacts or, um, on, on women living with HIV. And I know that uh, your research um, focused on, on, on the issue of shame among women living with HIV in Ireland. Could you tell us a little bit about your research, please? Sure, thanks Sue. Um, so yes, yeah, so my research focused on, I suppose, the narratives of women living with HIV and how shame um, I suppose featured in that and that came from a recognition that HIV related stigma was very much um, an issue that women were still facing in Ireland um, but more so I suppose the reason that I decided to carry out research with with women was because there was such kind of a lack of mm. research that focused specifically on women in Ireland um, and I suppose one of the kind of I suppose I'll, I'll talk about kind of my the first two sets of findings now for this particular segment and then maybe I'll talk about the third for the for the for the next segment but um I suppose one of the major issues um and this was as I talk about shame a, a, a lot of this kind of came out in women not wanting to um share their status with particular groups of people and concealing and withhold their status was kind of a, a major manifestation of that um and one of the reasons that this developed was there seemed to be, or from their perspective, there seemed to be, um, I suppose, no widespread encouraging discourse for these women to engage with, engage with upon diagnosis. So in that critical phase where women were, um, 
I suppose when they were kind of during that sense making phase during that adaptation to their diagnosis their I suppose their perceptions of HIV was overwhelmingly a very negative one and it was one that was associated with I suppose predominantly gay men in Ireland and that was that's where the or uh, the um, the discourse kind of uh, largely lies um, but they and I suppose I, I suppose I must my must predispose this in saying that this is kind of exclusive to the 12 women that I was speaking to so I'm not really generalizing here and um, but that they were overwhelmingly met with this sense of isolation that there aren't other women like me who are experiencing this and that's very very um I suppose crucial in that kind of development of shame it's something that really contributes to silence and something that really contributes to not wanting to um, speak openly about it although that's actually one of the things that's really beneficial for unburdening one sense of shame but the two things really contradict each other um, and I suppose and kind of going on from that this sense of the avoidance and the anticipation sorry and then the avoidance of I suppose what I termed as undesired exposure and um, that feeling of kind of feeling exposed feeling vulnerable and um, you know having this assumption that people are going to what are people going to think of me and ultimately people are going to think negatively and how that contributed to then a further sense of um I, I I really need to hide this I need to hide this from a certain group of people particularly or a particular person um now there's there's many women that I spoke to who at the time of the interviews were very much like this is not a you know this isn't really a concern for me now I am very much able to talk about this with the people in my life however there were certain stages that maybe and um, they're, you know, post-diagnosis and in that years in the adaptation phase where they just really couldn't speak about it with other people. And I suppose in manifestations of that, um, there seemed to be really harmful negative effects. And I don't think kind of even within the HIV HIV community but in the broader community around women's health shame is really really impactful negatively when it goes kind of undiscussed and um, when we don't talk about it. Um, but it has such a kind of silent negative impact. And um, there were women who, I, I suppose, something that I found really shocking were women who were living in direct provision who, because they were, I suppose, sharing close spaces with um, other women who might have been from different or similar cultural backgrounds. Um, but their perception was is that somebody cannot see me take this medication because automatically they will assume that it's for HIV. So unfortunately, these women were actually, on, in some cases, were defaulting their medication, which goes on to show how shame can be not only a psychological burden, but a physiological burden. Um, as we know, as um, as Aaron pointed out, the importance of kind of keeping up medication regime and um, taking it at a similar time every day to make sure viral load uh is kind of kept at a reduced level so that was that was a serious frustration um for those women you know that they had to default their medication and um they talked about different strategies to be able to kind of take their medication in private um and as well i suppose that I, it, again it was a serious kind of emotional um burden that they were kind of carrying around with them not being able to discuss it freely and um, i suppose and, and when we talk about the next uh segment i, I talk, i'll talk about some of the things that these women then developed to really help kind of unburden themselves of this um of this shame and the the, the tactics that they employed then and the wonderful peer support so i'll talk about that later on but they, those are some of the the primary the, the primary findings but also as well one thing I suppose going into and, and Aaron touched on this as well going into clinics specifically I, um, I suppose non-HIV non-sexual health um, specific clinics so maybe a GP a dentist uh, different um, let's say for somebody who might have been going to for a colonoscopy or various other procedures and um, some of the mentality of healthcare workers as some women talked about was quite problematic um, and I think men or healthcare workers who are I suppose, dealing with vulnerable populations or populations where with a condition that may be stigmatizing or stigmatized, um, you know, really should be advocates all the way through for women. I suppose not just women living with HIV, but um everyone living with HIV to because in some cases a healthcare worker might be the only person that uh, a woman living with HIV, maybe one of few people that they actually speak to and kind of in depth about their condition. So I suppose it's really important not to underestimate the impact that maybe a throwaway comment or a sentence or a question might really negatively impact on those women. A number of women I spoke to had been asked on several occasions, different people, you know, where did you get it? Can I ask you casually, like, how did you get it? And that really impacted on um 
you know, this sense of, you know, the, I suppose, unhelpful and really kind of problematic discourse that women who were living with HIV um, might be somewhat kind of promiscuous or over, overly sexual. And that's absolutely not the case, as we know, and it really shouldn't be um, upheld or sustained. But that was kind of what they were speaking about in terms of, well, do they think I'm this way or do they think I'm that way? You know, so really, really unhelpful um, questions. But yeah, I suppose dealing with them, um, um it's situations where women aren't being fe feeling empowered or where they're feeling discriminated against really kind of emerged as well. Thanks so much, Ellie. Uh, Nadine, I might come to you now. And I, 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 Ellie's been talking about the experiences of, of women living with HIV in, in Ireland. And I know I'd love for you to speak about your, your experience of working with, with women living with HIV in, in a global context. Mm -hmm. um, are the issues different? Are they the same? Or, you know, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, thank you so much, Sue. Um, you know, I love to, I was thinking about, um, you know, as I was thinking about coming here today and, you know, on International Women's Day, I always take a little moment out of my day to just think about who, what women have, powerful women have inspired me, people, you know, women who have mentored me, who've influenced me and, you know, women who have put a, a kind of a, a edged a place deep in my heart. And many of those women are friends, women living with HIV or women affected by HIV, whose families have been affected by HIV. HIV um, across Asia, Africa, and um, here in Ireland. And, you know, specifically, I love to name women, you know, it's not the women or, or globally, we sometimes talk, but I'm talking about women like Noreen, like Um, like Joe and Sandra and Liz and Susan and Sylvia and Niasha and Maud and Ronica and Saru, and the list goes on and on. Uh, incredible women. Um, as you said, uh, Sue, I've been working in HIV with with HIV and people living with HIV for a, a long time now and early on in my career I was living in Thailand I was volunteering in women's groups that's actually how I really started um, started being involved um, and I became really close with a wonderful Filipino woman 28 years old called Marife and in fact we named our daughter after her um, Alana Marife um, is what we named her and and speaking of daughters I'm just so proud of my daughter on International Women's Day um, and I love to just uh, to mention that um, but Marife, of course, was, you know, she was living with HIV and um, at the time, access and availability to ARVs was really challenging. The drugs had just come out. People will remember AZT and the complications with AZT. It had just come out and that was all that was available. And at the time I helped her fundraise, raise some money for AZT and also to go out and buy a fridge. She had never owned a fridge before and AZT needed to be stored in a fridge for her to take it. So she started taking this medication and for some months she felt so excited about life. She felt so free, she was so hopeful. Um, but after a few months, the side effects of, of the medication were just too much for her to bear um, and she had to stop. Now, deep down, what really struck me about Marife is that she felt it was karma. She felt that all the, all the way throughout, she talked how afraid she was that people in her home in Philippines would find out that she was HIV positive. Her mother, her sisters, her friends, her extended family. She didn't share her journey with them because she believed that she deserved what had happened to her. The self stigma and the shame was so great. And, you know, Marife, she didn't live very long after that. She, she died and she died in shame. And, and her fears of what people would think and would say, her own self stigma, her shame, and the bias that she feared society would have against her killed her. And she died now, she, she died with support of her friends around her and lots of love, but not her family. And it struck me, I mean, that was 25 years ago. And it struck me that, you know, since then I've worked with incredible people living with HIV, um, some of the greatest activists and leaders in the HIV mo movement globally. And still, people suffer, women and men suffer from self-stigma and shame. And I'm talking about like low self-worth, feelings of inadequacy, feelings of not belonging, of not being accepted, and um, lack of self-love and overall a kind of an underlying recurring cognitive position that there's something wrong with me. There's something, there must be something wrong with me. And of course that's fueled by society's views and, and society's stigma that's still very prevalent um, today. You know, we know, like Ellie was saying, we know that self-stigma and shame, it leads to isolation, it negatively ad affects adherence, and even just your ability to, if you don't believe that you're worthy of living or worthy of taking the medication, then you don't take your medication. So women um, and men experience a lower quality of life, and self-stigma leads to shame. Um, 
which we know I'm del delighted Ellie is here and is going to share more about today. Um, I, I think it's amazing that, and, and it's, it's, it's incredible that still today, you know, all the medication in the world, U equals U, all the powerful messages, and still people in Africa, Asia, and Europe are dying of self-stigma and shame. Um, and just to be clear, you know, stigma, I love to take these things apart because we talk about them interchangeably a lot. You know, stigma is when you think negative things about me because I'm living with HIV, discrimination when you do negative things to me because I'm living with HIV and self stigma is like when I think or do negative things to myself because I'm living with HIV. Um, for me, I realized how powerful self stigma was as a woman when I returned to Ireland um, 10 years ago and I was going through a divorce in this country um, and the thoughts of being a failure of not being good enough of not belonging and the fear of what people were going to think about me as a woman as a single parent here in Ireland and um, it was just immense and I think it was that profound experience in my own life and how I turned my own life around together with um, my research in Open Heart House which many of us will remember hugely with huge fondness um, you know that was in 2012 that inspired me to co-found the organization organization uh, Beyond Stigma and since then we've been able to go on and develop um, very powerful programs working in Zimbabwe, in Vietnam and in Ireland and um, working with um, you know different marginalized populations including people living with HIV and young people living with HIV. Um, you know I've seen through the years um, and no matter where I've worked, and I've worked in many different countries, wherever I have worked, I've seen that community responses are, the, are, are when things happen. That is the most powerful way that society can change its norms and improve lives. And of course, at the heart of all those communities is women and their children. Um, and I want to say a little bit, if I can, Sue, about women and HIV specifically. Is that okay? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was thinking, you know, Michel Sidibe, who's the former executive director of UNAIDS, he said not long ago that the HIV epidemic unfortunately remains an epidemic of women. And it's important on International Women's Day to highlight why HIV is different for women. Um, so, you know, just, just consider this, you know, every four minutes, imagine every four minutes, three young women are becoming infected with HIV. As we sit here in this webinar, Imagine that every four minutes, three young women are becoming infected with HIV. We know HIV, it's driven by gender inequality and unequal power dynamics, and they're deeply entrenched in societies around the world, including Ireland. <laughs> not, not much has changed there. Um, women account for more than half the number of people living with HIV worldwide. So I heard us say we were saying 25% 25, 25 of new infections are, are in women in Ireland, and it's, it accounts for, for more than half the number of people living with HIV. HIV when you go globally. Um, young women twice as likely to acquire HIV as young men of the same age. And we know that HIV disproportionately affects women and that it, you know, and adolescent girls because of the vulnerabilities that are created with unequal cultural and social and economic status. Um, harmful practices like early childhood marriage, that that really places women and girls at higher risk of, of HIV infection. And in countries where HIV prevalence is high, and there are many of them, women who experience intimate partner violence are 50% more likely to acquire HIV than women who have not experienced violence. And you know, female sex workers, 10 times more likely to acquire HIV than other women. 10 times more likely. And then attitudes towards sex outside of marriage. We know a lot about this in this country. Mm -hmm. um, attitudes, uh, restricted social autonomy of women, that reduces access to sexual and reproductive health services. And can you imagine that still in 29 countries today, women require consent of a spouse or a partner to access sexual reproductive health services? It's quite incredible to me. Um, and I think with, with women and HIV, you know, again, there are some really there are some specific differences uh, even biologically and complications that that women and challenges that women overcome as women as only women can you know complications living with HIV such as you know repeated vaginal yeast infections and uh, we, we all know what that feels like imagine if you're getting them again and again and again a uh, severe pelvic inflammatory disease and um, a higher risk of cervical cancer we're starting to become more aware of that now 
and issues with menstrual cycle, a higher risk of osteoporosis, and also entering menopause younger. And then even the side effects can be different of the medication and they can interact with the hormonal like birth control pills. And then, you know, like Erin was talking about, you know, the all of the issues around pregnancy and, and giving birth to our children. And of course, you know, the risk of giving HIV to, to your baby, you know, you know, in utero or, or during childbirth. And um, that's obviously still a real risk for many women in countries of Africa um, and Asia. Um, you know, I love so last last week I was with uh, Liz Martin and we were we had the absolute pleasure of meeting um, Winnie Bean Nima, who is the executive director of UNAIDS. And Liz was a star. Um, I know she won't mind me. She won't mind me saying that. But, you know, she spoke about her experience in Ireland um, 30 years ago. She talked about her life in Ireland. She shared all about her experiences. She shared about how she had tackled stigma and how she'd been able to speak you know it, it, her way of tackling stigma was to speak openly no matter how difficult it was in the small communities in rural Ireland that she was living in and she turned her experience of self-stigma and of stigma into something that was an important learning opportunity for our young people and for all of us actually in Ireland um, and I love that on today you know we we get ourselves inspired by Liz and all the brave women living with HIV um, and I love that theme to break the bias um, and for me breaking that bias around stigma self-stigma shame um there's there's a lot more we can do right thank you so much uh, yeah. Nadine uh Mary Jo I'm going to come to you um and Nadine was talking about um you know women and HIV in, in 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 countries outside of Ireland but we're bringing it back home and I just want to ask you maybe from your lived experiences and also as your role as a peer support worker or a member of the women's group what do you think are the the prominent issues that are affecting women living with HIV in Ireland? Thank you first of all I want to say there has been some powerful issues just being mentioned here and I've to listen to these brilliant women I have um, traveled a journey internally. I felt my heart pounding at some stage, going being there. So I know what you're saying. Um, it was, and it was a bit emotional. And so I'm just going to get myself together and answer your question there. Um, I am going to speak about me and my lived experiences. Um, the first thing I want to say is every time I come on to speak on something like this or, or be part of something like this, I'm amazed, impressed, by, and, and also. Uh, all, by all the different nuances and all of this and living for women living with HIV. For me, um, first of all, um, I celebrated 10 years last um, September of being diagnosed. Um, never, little did I think I'd ever say I would use the word celebrated in 10 years. And I actually stood in the square of Lisbon um, last October and stood there and go, wow, if I could go back to the woman that was sitting at the table 10 years ago, in that very dark place and just hug her and say, look where you've got girl, you can do this. Uh, but there is a journey. Um, and there is a lot, as, as, as the ladies have just said there, there's a lot of internalized stigma. There's a lot of silence. There's a lot of fear. There, and, and when I started off first 10 years ago, um, I remember, um, I'm a bit stubborn, so I said, no, I'm going to, you know, um, medically wise, I'm going to hand that over to, to the, to, to the medical team, work away, um, but I need to look after me. Something, again, like mentioned there, I blame myself. You know, why did I get this? Oh, this karma, I got this. So I need to get sorted. And internally, what was it? I went to my local group um, in Limerick, um, to Scotia at that time. Um, I got fantastic counselling. And through that, I met, they, they had one of the first meetings in, in Limerick, what's past now. And the journey all this has taken me on. With, with that, um, then I met Aaron, um, went to a meeting in Dublin, met Aaron, um, been, and, and um, done so much focus uh, groups um, um, and other projects quietly. And again, uh, like um, Nadine just said about Liz saying, I'm, I'm okay to speak openly, but not loudly. Uh, speaking openly means that, like if an instance something like say, if, if, if you just need to be able to say it and say in a medical circumstance or just something going, I'm HIV, or just being able to say it, I'm a person living with HIV, but say it without having the whole load of everything else you've gone through come with it. Um, also, I have two kids and I went through the journey of, oh my gosh, how am I going to tell them? 
Um, and because I'm involved with peer group, and because I'm in, um, in a part of a women's group, and um, that, that women's group was started back in July, I think, 2018. And unfortunately, we had a couple of years of a uh, no-go area uh, fall on top of us. Um, but we were before that, we used to meet up regularly. It was amazing. It was fantastic to be able to sit in a room with so many different women and be able to hear the stories, but the joy of being able to meet other women. When I first started, I remember saying the question, is there anybody out there like me? Um, meeting Pazanat was fantastic. The boys were amazing and Aaron was amazing. Uh, and, and thank God I took a step because I, first of all, I was being with someone going, no, I want to meet other women like me. But there wasn't anybody that I could find at the time. So I had to go the route, the only route that was available. But the difference in 10 years, now there are so many women out there. Uh, the, the, the WhatsApp group for the women's, uh, the women's group is the amount that's on there, it's just amazing. Um, and to the woman that's managing that, well done you, because I mean, that group wouldn't be going until, uh, unless you were behind it and adding the names and, and choosing people to it. Um, that could be got through Erin in, in, in um, HIV Ireland. She does that. Um, going to having support, listening to other stories, being there, listening to other women, I started to gather the courage to tell my kids. And by God, it took courage to tell my kids. Because me as a mother, it's my job. And especially as, as, as um, Nadine just said, Ireland, I'm now 59. I was 49 at the time. So I'm of an older generation. And my first image of HIV when I was younger was the, the plague, as we called at that time. So they were horrific images. So I had to overcome all that. In my head, that's what I thought my kids had an image of. I'd forgotten that there was other work done and they've, they talk differently. Um, so I actually had to take courage and I said, look, I'm going to tell my kids because somebody said to me one time, the most important thing is look at the beauty of what's in front of you. And I kept looking elsewhere and I realized, oh yeah, just my two kids. Um, and they're fine with me saying this. They're, they're actually very, very good. So I sat them down and I spoke to them. And as I said to you, Sue, uh, the response from my son was amazing because at the time, I think it was the early 20s or late teens, I can't remember right now. And he just looked at me and said, Mom, the story's all wrong. He said, Normally it's me, she would be coming into you. Um, but they were fantastic. And the reason I took time to tell them as well, it was I wanted to make sure they had somebody in their life that they were okay to share this weight. Because I didn't want to give them this story and feel like me that I had nowhere to go with this story. Yeah. At the start, I mean, two years of going nowhere with the story. Standing in my choir, and they're a marvellous bunch of women, good for whom know now, but standing in the choir, standing alongside somebody, thinking in my head, God, if they only knew what I had, would they want to stand so close? And uh, going from that, and I didn't want them to have that feel. So I sat them down and I said, right, now I know you're ready because I'd seen journeys they'd gone through. And I went, yeah, you have your solid friends. Oh my God, they were amazing. Because we forget kids are wonderful. Kids love you, your kids love you because you have brought them up. And I told them the story and sorry for the emotion, they were fantastic. From that story, um, the amount of people have gone and get tested uh, because of were going, oh wow. Um, because I, I didn't fit their perception of a person that was of that get HIV. I just, sorry, I don't, I'm, I hope I'm phrasing this correctly um, because I don't want to come across wrong. I didn't fit in the whole story, right? Um, and so from that, and even now, and that was about four or five years ago, even now, the story's coming back to me and I'm going, oh, wow, are you still talking about it? Things are still happening from that one conversation around that kitchen table that time. And I did it with confidence with them. They're happy with the story. And, and, and from that, they've actually turned around and said, uh, like, they've said, Mom, I'm ready to talk sometime to anybody that's, you know, have somebody in their family that, especially parent, that did like to know if they want to share the experience, we'll be ready. Give us a couple of years and we'll be ready for that. But it'd be lovely to have a group like that out there. And I'm going, oh, yeah, we just we forget that. And then, so, uh, sorry. I think come back into the room because it is a journey. It is very emotional. <laughs> I'm going to the kitchen now and I come back into this room. <laughs> the, uh, so anyway, we one of the the group the, um, uh, the support the women's group thing that we were at a really big meeting and I remember chatting to a few of them. We can never tell, never tell. And I know for a fact that after having chat and saying telling the story of how I trusted my kids yeah. because they're wonderful human beings. Um, 
not all the time, but they are. <laughs> the amount of women I know that took that step and the difference it made in their relationship was fantastic because what stuck in my mind was I was going for help one time. And when you're going, and I know this might seem off the track, but these are the little things we encounter in our life because of, of hiding and such stigmatization and trying to keep up a front, but being exhausted underneath it, medically unwell underneath it. So you're in the social web for place. So you're in, I was had to, I know, because I was a single, and also down top role, I was a single mom as well, uh, trying to rear my kids and trying to build a life for myself. And so in college, so I, I wasn't working. When I stood in that social welfare office and there, this officer was looking at me um, and he was looking at me going, you're hiding something. And of course, that's our job. They want to see if we're hiding something. Mm -hmm. And I suddenly looked at him and I went, right, I'll be back. And I made an hour later, I returned to him with a letter, a handwritten letter. And I handed it to him and I said, Look, I'm trusting you with this information. I gave him that information about me and who I am yeah. and what I was going through. He took it, he went, thank you, I appreciate that. He changed immediately because, and I went, okay, I'm doing this to my kids as well. That was before I, I taught my kids. Mm -hmm. And I went, yeah, when you're hiding something, they don't know there's a distrust there, but there's also, there's a, when I'm not, you're not that normally, your, your character is not that person. Mm -hmm. They go, what is it? What's going on? And because it's so huge for me that time, um, that was a change for me. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, no, I think you've done trying to hold it um so so from the beginning to la last year in Lisbon I stood and went wow look at the amount of women I know right now yeah. look how powerful they are look at the wonderful work they're doing there's some fantastic women out the door it, you know even being in Lisbon seeing all that even here in Ireland the women's group is amazing uh just knowing that they're there uh just knowing you can ask a silly question like can I take this with my medication to somebody and then even just to go away with a few of them, and we've done that, a few of us have together, we've become very good friends. And we go away together and we sit in the room and we just talk free um, and learn to talk free and gives us a chance to gradually own what we're going through and take the next step without it being in a, um, in a have to way kind of a thing. Okay. Um, yeah, so to me, support, going for support, Working with wonderful people that are out there that are, like I mean, that are, are help creating this. Um, and my 10 year journey and looking back and listening to Ellie's research and everything, I'm going, oh my God, you've just taken me back for 10 years mm -hmm. and getting here. Uh, it has changed so much, but it's still stigma. That's it's good. still, and the only people have said to me recently, well, but it's internal stigma, it's self stigmatization for two people that didn't have HIV yeah. in a medical setting. And I'm looking and going, but you, do the journey and understand it's still there um, um but we are working is growing and the women are doing amazing work behind the scenes That's behind it amazing work fantastic and um thank you so much mary jo for, for sharing uh, about your journey i'm just going to check with um questions and see if people have any questions or comments um first we have one comment um from sophie at sophia forum uh, thank you for this. Lovely to attend. Special shout out to Nadine, whose research I still use today. So there you go. Uh, a question for um, Mary Jo. How do I get involved or meet up with the women's group? Is there a phone number or email or website? If you contact Erin, um, Erin at, at HIV, um, she can put you in touch with the person that can get you onto the women's group and we'd be delighted to see you on there Great. because we are planning to meet up soon um can't wait for that because i've missed the ladies so that would be fantastic uh, and the more the merrier because we're a wonderful bunch <laughs> if, you <laughs> say, if you say so yourself oh yes definitely <laughs> i think we'll have aaron's uh email address will have gone up um i think on, on the chat anyway okay so we have spoken about the the, the varied issues that affect women living with hiv um, and I suppose now it's time to turn our attention to what we can do to to overcome these issues or how we are going to address them. Nadine, I'm going to come to you first. Um, and you did mention um, the organisation that you created Beyond Stigma, which focuses on, on um, self-stigma. Could you tell us a little bit more about that organisation and how it works? 
Yeah, so um, thank you. And um, just to say, I was just so touched, Mary Jo. It's just so, um, it's just so inspiring. So inspiring, and you know, for for how, however and whatever it, it takes to support, you know, Mary Jo and the women that you're that you're connected with, um, to do, to be able to share your your experience. I think that's the thing that all of us could do the most. And so, tell us, you know, how to support you, and and how we can, um, you know, how we can break the silence. I know the I know the theme is break the bias, but um, you know, coming back to Ireland ten years ago, um, I was really um, I, I expected you know, I expected that that there would be people who would be, you know, shouting from the rooftops about the injustice of HIV and um, and particularly women. And and I realized that this environment was not conducive for women to feel that they were safe to come out and safe to speak and, sp and safe to share. And it is changing um, and it's very slow. And um, I think that's something we can do. How can we support women in more collaborative spaces to be to feel safe and to share? Um, and then in terms of Beyond Stigma, um, you know, like I said, inspired by my own experience, and I think all of us here are self-stigma experts. That's often what I say when I talk about self-stigma. It just depends on what card, you know, whether it was, for me, it was divorce. Um, for Mary Jo, it's HIV. For each of us, there's something where you just think that people out there are going to think something terrible about you because of something you've done or or who you 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 perceive yourself to be um, and i think that for me the idea of of changing of really looking at why i would think that you would think that about me why would you think that about me and really questioning is that actually true that people think that i'm a bad person or i'm a failure and so it's a very internal process and very quite a deep process of inquiry to understand what you're believing about people out there and then when you can really see that in fact you know either it's mo it's it's for the most part not true and the research actually supports us to say that that what we you know what people think about us and even for people pe what people think about people living with HIV is not often true Sometimes it is, but not often. So even the research supports us. So when I change what I think about me, then I go out in the world and either I see that you don't think about me, you, you don't think that, or I meet you and I think, gosh, you have some issues here. Would you like me to educate you? Or you know what, you're too ignorant for me and it, you've got nothing to do with me. Out of my way, please, till I continue my journey. So there's power in that. So I think that focusing on self stigma is really important because I think that focusing when I love myself, I go out in society loving myself and then I can change the stigma. Then I can change the stigma and the perceptions out there. So it's like a power from within. And in Beyond Stigma, that's what the programs have focused on. So we're at the moment in the middle of a two year project working with uh, 30 young people living with HIV in Zimbabwe between 80 and 24 years old. We've put a program together that supports this kind of inquiry. We call it the work of Byron Katie, a very powerful self inquiry process to look at beliefs. Um, and we put it together with music, we put it together with creativity and art and lots of activities. And we cover really tough, tough, tough um, issues like shame and what I think you think of me and sexuality and having children and, and being, you know, how can I go out there in the world and have an education? We, we cover all of the different judgments of that I have on myself and that I think you have on me. Um, and the results are phenomenal. And um, we have, we've always done research with our programs. And this is the third program in Zimbabwe. We had one living, uh, one with adults living with HIV, one with gender-based violence, working with survivors of women who of who for the most part are also living with HIV. Um, and then more recently um, with, uh, with young people uh, in Zimbabwe. And we are absolutely um, trying together with HIV Ireland to bring that program here to Ireland. And I have no doubt with Susan and Erin and Sue and everybody and Mary Jo and others, we will, we will manage to do that. So yeah, there's lots to be done. I, I was just going to ask, has there ever been a program run in Ireland but there obviously hasn't but that's the hope and that we really, that is yeah that yeah and amazing. so just just to say it makes me think and really it, it actually makes me um, emotional to think that this journey started with the incredible incredible there were 17 um people living with HIV in open heart house who shared their experiences of self-stigma with me from my research in 2012 and the programs that we designed in Zimbabwe were based on their beliefs what we understood about self-stigma and shame so it's really fitting that we would bring that home <laughs> um, and and we're trying and I know we will. <laughs>
Brilliant. Thank you so much. Mary Jo, I might come back to you um, again and just, I suppose you've already spoken about the importance of the women's group and having that support of other women in your journey. Um, so we're, we're looking now at and how people, uh, women overcome um, their issues around, um, uh, you know, living with HIV. You recently trained as a peer support worker. Um, congratulations. And the peer support program, I'm sure there's details up there on the chat. Um, what is it about peer support that, you know, what does that offer um, that's different from other types of support? I think yeah, the, the peer support, what it offers is um, the peers have actually done the journey, gone through the journey themselves and got themselves to a good point um, where they feel strong with themselves. And Nadine made a brilliant point there about your, 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 your self-worth and working on who you are yourself. I've done that and Brittany Brown is amazing. I love that. The, 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 the working on your own shame and when you can stand in your own space and go, I am a powerful nurturing beautiful woman I'm valid and if you can't see that that's okay that's how you look at it but this is why I'm going to be and when I started stepping into that arena the, the the difference it caused within me was fantastic so when you're a peer support worker you need to be in a space like that but also while and I've mentioned this when uh do before so when um doing the peer support training to see the other peers on there and how happy they are to be at the stage where they can offer their support to somebody else, their experience. And if they don't know, if they haven't experienced it, they know somebody that has, and they can help that other person through it as well. Uh, even knowing that there's a peer support worker out there uh, that has gone through this journey and is there for you, in itself is support because you go, okay, they're getting to a stage where they have done a journey. Because I think um, oh, the advocates, fantastic, everything. But when you've got somebody telling their own, being the, you know, being there with you, that travel's journey, sometimes you can say something, they go, yes, I know exactly what you're talking about, without making it their story as well. Um, the peer, peer, peer training is fantastic. Um, it was, uh, we had to go through, check with our values, everything, it is challenging. Um, but seeing the strengths it brings out in us um, and for other people that we want to support and I know that a lot of people have gone through it first of all, have used the peer support and it's working fantastic for them um, uh, I, something I think is highly recommended and I would love to see a massive network throughout Ireland uh, so that it's either localised or you have a choice where to go uh, as well Okay, that's brilliant because I, I mean you've just mentioned there that even just participating in the training itself was empowering for you uh, and, and then in turn then you can bring that to the people that you will support so uh, yeah. well done and, and long may it continue. Ellie I'm going to bring you in here now and and, and you mentioned a bit uh, earlier that um, your research brought up um, how women had overcome um, some of these um, psychosocial impacts. Could you talk to us a little bit about that? Unmute myself, apologies. Uh, yeah, so actually a lot of, I suppose, what I would have to say would very much follow on from what Mary Jo just stated there. The I think the, the, the power of discovering a shared experience with other women, particularly for something that one might feel um, self-stigma and shame about, like cannot be understated. It is so powerful to see I'm not alone. There are other people like me. And that's really powerful in being able to deconstruct that shame and normalizing that experience, um, whether it's the experience of living with HIV or something else, to say that this is actually you know, something that other people deal with. It's not something that I'm isolated in. Um, so whether that's through the women's group that um, Mary Jo and Erin are involved in or whether it's um, the peer support work that Mary Jo would provide, um, that is absolutely, um, it, it really kind of emerged in, this, in the study for, for women who had engaged with other people mm -hmm. that it was, it, it brought kind of a lot of kind of goodness into their life. Um, but another thing I suppose that, that follows on from one of the previous points that I made um, is that visibility and representation for women in these kind of forums. So, I mean, I don't know, I think I've been at a good few um, kind of panels like this and only recently kind of seeing Liz on the Irish um, Global Health Networks forum. And now yourself, Mary Jo, I know you spoke actually on a, on a, on a panel 
panel last year um, at one point, and now you're here again. So seeing seeing women speak openly and encouragingly um, about your journeys and sharing your struggles and sharing what has happened to you uh, was all, would also be really you know beneficial. But at the same time, that role in terms of creating that awareness and creating that visibility shouldn't just fall on women to kind of share their stories as well. That also came out from the research that there really should be incorporation of women's centered, uh, I suppose, issues and concerns and questions and just kind of general discourse that applies specifically to women because as Nadine pointed out so eloquently that there are very much issues that are concerned uh, exclusively to women. Um, and that for now I'm not a public health expert I I'm, I'm sure there's many people who would be well able to to weigh in on this but I suppose in terms of campaigning and uh, advocacy that we could have I suppose women-centered information kind of in on that as well just to kind of bring up and I know one or two of the participants said that they would love to see um, a website or I suppose a part of a website on HIV Ireland that was I suppose um, specific to women kind of sharing those stories Bring, raising that visibility and um, kind of raising their voices so that upon diagnosis there is somewhere you can go to be like okay I, I actually don't need to spend months or years in isolation there is I suppose stories and all that I can um, that I can I suppose, read and appreciate and understand to kind of help that 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 process or that journey so that that women don't have to do it on that they don't have to do it on their own and um, so yeah I'll, I'll finish off with that there. Okay. Thanks very much Ellie. Erin I want to come to you now um, and you mentioned about breastfeeding and about um, IVF. What are we doing um, to overcome this or what can we do to overcome these issues that are kind of impacting women living with HIV or and in, ge in, in, in general from your experiences uh, uh, of managing community support, what can we do to overcome the many issues that face uh, women living with HIV? Um. Good question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, firstly, I just I second everything that's been already said, so I, I won't repeat anything there. But um, really, really, really good points have been brought up. So for us, it's really I think about you know almost doing an audit of where you know these issues are occurring, who the key players are in order to um, you know um, get change to happen. Right, because it's really important that change does happen. Uh, it does take a little bit of work. The IVF, for example, has been, and I'm going to use this word, nightmarish, because it is it is a hidden issue. If you go onto any of the uh, IVF sites with the hospitals that are, are currently doing this, the only thing about HIV is either around somebody having to test for infectious diseases before they embark on the, the IVF journey, or it's about the six month quarantine of the sperm that has to occur if somebody donates sperm for IVF. So there's nothing there to kind of alert women that are living with HIV that they will have to go abroad, for example. Now there's something wrong about that, <laughs> right? right? Where that kind of issue is so, is so hidden and almost the same about the breastfeeding as well. Now that may come up obviously within the, the maternity hospitals, but there's not a lot out there around that or around why uh, women are encouraged to, to bottle feed instead. So it is, I think, about agencies like HIV Ireland really getting down to the nitty gritty, finding out, you know, where we can, um, you know, create change in relation to, to the impacts that, that women are feeling. And also to really get, I think, a bigger feel because we know only from the voices of the women coming into us. Yeah. Right. We don't know how many people out there, for example, uh, how many w women um, had to go to the UK, you know, didn't realize we're planning IVF treatment, you know, didn't know about this. So there's a, a really big piece of work, I think, that that we need to do Thank on you. this. Yeah. Thanks. Man. Does anyone have anything that they'd like to add or make a comment on? Mary Jo, go ahead there. Yeah. Just, a, um, just would love to give a shout out, uh, seeing that it's an International Women's Day and happy International Women's Day to everybody, to the wonderful women that are behind the scenes, uh, mm -hmm. to the wonderful women living with that are behind the scenes doing amazing work. Um, I wouldn't be the woman without them. And so, you know, uh, I just want to acknowledge them. Um, I would, I, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking I would love to have asked their permission just to throw out their names because I think they've done just fantastic work. 
uh, just even the first names. Uh, you know who you are, um, and with your, you're behind the scenes, you're working. Um, and also, the one thing when I started off this journey was I was afraid to speak out, uh, you know, to have a conversation openly, right, to speak openly, because I was afraid that I'd be, oh, picked up and go, you're an advocate now, get out there and do a lot of stuff. And the fear of that was huge. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to say is it's okay to speak openly to, to us within the groups, everything. We're not going to, you know, uh, the groups are not like that. And I, I don't know, I'm speaking for myself from this and I think there's a lot of other women. Um, just trust us, we're a group that you just speak openly, but you don't have to speak out. Um, and thank you. Thanks very much. I'm going to actually go to the questions and comments again, um, which we have. Um, I'm just making sure I didn't. Yeah. Okay. A comment from one of the attendees. Well done, Mary Jo. That's very motivational. Um, from Louise. Amazing to listen to you, Mary Jo. Thank you. These are all for you, Mary Jo. Come on. There. <laughs> uh, another comment from an attendee. Mary Jo, you have moved and inspired us all. Thank you. Um, comment. Another comment. Wonderful panel and speakers all bringing great different perspectives. Another comment. Brilliant to hear you, Mary Jo. It does indeed take time. As a woman living with HIV myself for 19 years, the journey continues. Thank you for your visibility as we need to see ourselves in all our diversities. Keep doing your amazing work. Um, well done, everyone. Uh, Mary Jo, breaking the stereotypical person is fantastic. Congrats on 10 years. We're the same age, so go girl. Um, another comment, thank you, Nadine. I'm a Zimbabwean living in Ireland. I'm really appreciative of what you're doing, bringing a difference on women living with HIV. HIV sorry, again, thank you so much. Um, peer support is powerful. Keep up the good work, Mary Jo. Um, another comment, meeting others who understand is so important for women living with HIV. And I think everyone is in consensus about that, all the panelists as well. Um, I wish we had more time to keep talking because I do think we could probably keep going for another couple of hours. But um, I, I think it's a it's a fantastic first step. We've had this conversation, and um, I think it's a really important conversation to have started. That we're looking at issues that are often ignored, overlooked, um, you know. And I think this is the start of 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 something of, of further discussion and then action. Um, which would be fantastic. Um, if you are a woman living with HIV and you're looking for support, including peer support, you can contact HIV Ireland. I'm sure the, um, it's all up there in the chat. Um, also, if you are working with women who are living with HIV or working with women who are more vulnerable to acquiring HIV and you're looking for more information or education around HIV, you can check out our training calendar uh, or contact us here at HIV Ireland as well. Um, I, I'm not, we're not finished yet, but um, before I do, I'm just actually, there's a question just come in there. So I might just quickly go to it before I, um, someone is saying, how about the six months exclusive breastfeeding for women, women living with HIV? I think this is for you, Erin, in terms of, you know, the way in resource poor countries there, um, it, they can, they're, what's, what's the word? They're advised to breastfeed exclusively for six months. Um, as, as opposed to, you know, form of feeding. Could that be a way to go, do you think? I'm not an expert yeah. on this, so I'm not really sure, but, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, for, uh, you know, women who are in situations where the alternative is not good, I mean, Nadine would probably be able to answer this better than I would, um, but certainly, you know, what we know is that there are certain circumstances where breastfeeding is encouraged because of the Sort of alternative but in countries where you know formula uh, is available and where you know whatever the risk isn't as bad yet but, okay. yeah so i don't know if nadine wants to hop in there on this one no, that's no. okay <laughs> um, <laughs> so um as i said we're not just finished yet i still have another thing too but i just want to extend my huge gratitude and thanks to the wonderful panelists thank you all so much for for giving up your time and for sharing your your expertise um today i, I really think your passion for improving the lives of, of women living with hiv is a testament to what international women's day 
is actually all about. So uh, a huge, huge thank you. Um, so may I just say one thing, sure, very, very short thing. I just, I'm so, so inspired by Mary Jo today and Liz last week. And I would just say, you know, women are amazing at supporting mm -hmm. other women. So stand on the shoulders of the women that are here in, in this, living in this country, stand on the shoulders and then stand on the shoulders above and above and, and you know, create such a strong support base for, for this issue. So thank you. Thanks very much, um, Nadine. And um, so before we actually do finish, I want to um, to wrap up the morning, I suppose, with some positive vibes. This is International Women's Day and it is about celebrating women. So I want to play a short video that's celebrating the lives of some women living with HIV. Uh, these women um, voluntarily uh, participated in our recent living project and living um, was a, it was or is a first of its kind uh, photographic exhibition that was launched by HIV Ireland and GCN on World AIDS Day of last year. Um, it, it, it's the aim of living really is to increase the visibility of people living with HIV in Ireland. And following um, a, a call out or a shout out to, to people, we got 13, um, 13 people agreed, 13 people living with HIV, uh, HIV agreed to participate, and three of those were women. So let's finish off the morning by listening to the voices of these, of, of, um, of Barbara, of Rebecca, and of Liz. Uh, thank you everyone for attending, and thank you to the panellists, and happy International Women's Day. You can roll it there, uh, Susan, well done there, thanks. All I can say, this is not a death sentence. If you take your medication the way you have been told by the doctor, it's you equals to you, which is undetectable and untransmittable. Fighting stigma, I think it's like, uh, people mustn't stay indoors. They have to go out and get support from other people. There are social groups outside. I will say, if they can't take it or they have to share with somebody whom they trust, whom they love. If they can't find somebody within their family, they have to look for a, a, a support worker. The support worker will be able to support the, the person who's struggling. This is not a death sentence. As long as you take your medication the way the doctor tells you to do so. The reason why I think we need to honour World AIDS Day, more than for me, more than anything, it's for the people that we've lost. It's for the people that didn't and weren't as lucky as I was to make it to medication time. People need to be very aware now that it is livable with. I'm an Irish transgender woman and I just feel, people say to me, how do you feel you got to where you are today? You know, you were diagnosed in 87 and medication didn't really come out till 94, 96, whatever. And I think it was the will to be Rebecca that won. I'm convinced of that. So I think it's really important that, that people are aware of that, that it's not this killer disease, this tombstone falling out of the sky. That was my era. So I think, I often think back, I often reflect and think it really must have been to be Rebecca. That was the most important thing. You know, I wasn't going to let it win. I'm very privileged to be here. I feel it's a message that, that needs to get out there, it's stamp out stigma and discrimination. I've lived with HIV for 30 years, so it's 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 been a, a long way to come. I didn't think I, I was actually gonna gonna make it this far, you know? So I'm I'm just so glad to be here. It's very important to, to get the word out. Like I'm living my HIV and I'm the same as you, I'm the same as everyone else. I have the same worries, the, the same fears and the same dreams. There is light at the end of the tunnel and have hope. Hope is so important, you know, you, you have to have hope. Thank you, everybody. Thanks very much, Sue. That was brilliant. Thank and thanks very much, everyone else. Thanks, everybody. Happy International Women's Day. Yeah, enjoy the rest of your day.
I used to. Thanks so much. That was wonderful. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. And happy Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. See you. Bye. -bye. <laughs>